Thank you. Okay, so for today, let's continue with smiling. Uh, two things, you have homework, please uh, finish your homework. A common question that I have received, and just to be sure that we are okay with that. Yes, you are doing in the homework clustering. Clustering is unsupervised. Yes, you are supposed to do not know the correct answers. So clusters, you do not know the correct answers. Unsupervised, that is one thing. However, something that you have, something that I give you is, I ask you for three different data sets. The one that correspond to my grades do not have labels. To be clear, the letters of the grades of the students are not the labels. Uh, you have numbers, and I am asking you to classify my students in different categories that are not exactly A, B, C, D. Uh, I am looking for some different classification that is up to you to provide. However, you have two data sets, one for the flowers, do you remember, in which even though I am asking you to use the data set for clustering, uh, the data set has the answers. And for creating a cluster, you ignore the answers. Uh, you only use the four values that you have, the, that, the data. So you have 150 rows with three columns, and that is what you are going to use for creating the clusters. Now, I am asking you for three clusters, and I am asking you for three clusters kind of because I know that the correct answer is three categories. And then at the end, I am asking you to compare your three clusters with the real solution, the correct solution, that for that particular data set you have it. So it's unsupervised. The clusters are going to be created without knowing that the answers are already there. Uh, you need to ignore or even delete if you want and create your cluster. That is the unsupervised learning, that is your work. An extra step that I am asking you to do, and this is extra, the academic purposes, is well, given the fact that you already know the answer, help me to compare that correct answer. For instance, we did it here, that each category is 50 rows. So each set, the correct answer should be 50. You are creating three clusters because I asked you for that. And you can easily visualize or notice how many entries you have in each cluster. And therefore, you can know how good or bad this clustering process was. Uh, again, I am only asking you for this extra step to you, for you to notice how good or bad this clustering can be, at least with the data set that I point out. Uh, for the flowers, it will be more or less. For the labor, uh, more or less, none of them will be perfect with clustering. Uh, one is three, the other is two, not exactly perfect or some high level of accuracy. And for my grades, really is a very small information, very dispersed data. I am not expecting that you create a perfect model to identify my students. So I am not looking for the good results. Don't worry if you get accuracy is very low when you compare. I am looking for you to experience the process and to work with the libraries. Make sense? Uh, I asked you for confusion metrics. Uh, something that I didn't clarify before is two things. Uh, you do not have a way to know the mapping of the categories. Again, the flowers. You are going to create three clusters and you know that the correct answer is three categories. But something that you do not know is which of the cluster correspond with which of the categories. You do not have information to make this mapping. Now, what you can do, I am okay if you match them randomly, and therefore your accuracy could be the one that is good or bad, or you can create three different matching, nine different combinations, and report the high accuracy because probably the one that match high is the correct matching, even though still the correctness could be low. The accuracy is going to be low, even if the higher of the values. But again, just for you to check. And I am aware that you do not have a perfect match because again, we're doing it supervised. Just for you to practice and play a little bit. Uh, confusion metrics and the accuracy, there is not a method that I am asking you to call. I am literally asking you to program this from scratch to compare the result in the cluster with the result that you can get from the data sets. Uh, I didn't give you instructions for that. It's not a method that you need to call. I ask you to practice your programming skills, literally, or do the research for the methods, whatever you want. Clear? 
Okay, don't forget to submit. Today, I want to ask you for homework and now for homework doing text mining. Your homework, just in case that I run out of time at the end. Uh, what I am going to open today is an assignment in which I am going to ask you to run, to implement all the things that we have been reviewing from the previous lecture and today about, I have a bunch of documents and for that documents, I want to know the topic. I want to create these clusters, uh, a number of clusters that you are going to define. And for each cluster, I want you to tell me like the central, the words that are key in that category, which is going to be the input. I am going to ask you to work with data that you want to use. Either you can go and freely take a data set from the links that I have shared with you before, or you can use web pages uh, from ASU or from any source that you want. Literally, what I want you to experience the fact that you can do this text mining with whatever information you have, your note for, from the class, if you want anything, just use the process with your data. It's going to work, should work. My first step, my first recommendation is that you do the process and implement this data set that I am using, the one that I am sharing with you, the BBC. Uh, when you have everything working, theoretically at least, the only thing that you need to do is to change your data set, change your files, and the process should work in the same way. Nothing to change in the source code. I want you to do that in your computers with some data, whatever you want, and then submit results. What I am asking you to submit, the result for this homework, as usual, a paper, the paper with your source code that is basically going to be my source code with some parameters that you're going to change, uh, a sample of your data set, whatever data set you are going to use. If you're going to use something that is publicly available, put the link. If you're going to use information from whatever project or web page or anything that you're using, the only thing that you need to do is to describe the data set. Uh, I am not going to rerun your program. Describe your data, describe your results, good, bad, medium. Uh, depending on the data, depending on your configuration, you can get good or bad results. Tell me about your results, how good or bad results this text mining with whatever data you decide to use. Makes sense. Uh, it's mostly what I have been asking you to do for the previous methods also. Clear? Okay, so in order to you do that, uh, we need to finish what we start in the previous lecture. And so far, if I remember correctly, something that we did previously is to introduce the library. Uh, we are working with this library, uh, Mallet. Uh, you already have the link. You already get the library. In particular, you get two JAR files. You have your JAR files in your IDE, and therefore you are able to run the source code that I am sharing with you in the different slides, right? Step number two, uh, the first thing to do in programming is so far we understand and we are able to create text, um, the iterator, the file iterator. Uh, we are able to create objects from this class and basically the objects from that class can receive worst case scenario, three parameters. The most important one is the directory or directories from which you want to get the data, uh, a filter for the text, for the files that you want to use. Uh, in this example, files with the extension txt. And the last parameter, this idea of the names that I want to use for the categories, the names that I want to use for the clusters. Again, is unsupervised. These are only for names if I want to use names, but you can use play without names and it's going to be group one, zero, one, two, three, four, and so on. As many as you put the value for key. The only parameter that is important, mandatory, obviously, is the first one, the directory. Where is your data, period. And the second one in importance will be to specify the filter. And the last one, the categories, use in case you want to use names. I am giving you both examples. This one with the three parameters. At the end, 
I show you the code with only two parameters, whatever works for you. Either you have the categories that you want to use, and probably those are the folders in which you put your files, or if you don't have it, don't use it. File iterator, step number one. And we reviewed this before. So another thing, something that you can do with the file iterator, a source code that maybe is the first one that you want to run, just to make sure that everything is working well, is this picture that you already have. Uh, is the file iterator from a particular folder in my computer, you need to be aware to change that folder, something that reflects your configuration in your IDE or whatever. And these lines here that have you given the angle before, this is you're going to print on the screen all the files that are going, the path for the files that you are going to use for the training part. Uh, is basically using the iterator and is printing all the files in all the subfolders, starting with that point. If you run this, your answer, your result should be a bunch of paths that are going to be printed, as many as files you have in that top uh, folder. Good. If this works well, then you can move to the next step. The next step, something that we mentioned before, is very, very important to pre-process the data. Uh, most of the things with text mining is we need to be sure that our input is valuable so the output can make sense somehow. Uh, cleaning the data, the pre-processing here for this particular library is applying a pattern, which pattern, pipelines, pipelines, something that we described before, Kind of a chain of responsibilities, but in the pipelines is not only one element they want to work, but all of them. So is use a production line, production line, pipelines, and what we have is pipes, and each pipe worker is going to do something. Now the pipeline for this library is an array, an array of pipes, and I think. The first line is very descriptive, an array list of pipes, a pipeline. Good. Uh, if you are using the pattern, you know that there is a different way to do this, in particular if you remember the chain of responsibilities. However, the implementation of the library is following this path. Uh, the only reason, because we are learning to do or to understand this as a pipeline even though it's not maybe exactly the best implementation of the pattern, is because that is the way that it's working in the library and we want to use the library. So we need to follow that rule. The array, each element is a pipe. The only thing that we need to do is to add pipes to the array. And each pipe that we are going to add to the array, let me be clear, someone is going to be reading the input and each element in the input, each word, each group of characters in the input, and we're going to define how many characters, is going to go to the first pipe, to the second pipe, and so on. And when all the pipes are executed, I have an output that corresponds to a particular input. So particular, you can imagine this like a particular line in your document, follow all the pipes, and at the end, you have the equivalent to that line, but pre-processed. Which kind of processing we're going to do? We mentioned before, number one, the character set. Uh, one good idea is to be sure that we are working in the correct character set. We mentioned the difference between Mac, Windows, and others. Uh, a good thing to do, UTF-8, transform my input, doesn't matter what character set is, to this one, so I am sure that from after the preprocessing, I am working there. All my characters correspond to this chart data set. Next, a uh, good idea, if you don't care about uppercase and lowercase, is to transform all of them to uppercase or lowercase. Typical thing to do, we usually do not transform to uppercase, we usually work with the lowercase. So the second pipe, the second class, can help you to do that. And I think you can figure out what could be the class or what could be the instruction there if we want to do uppercase instead of lowercase, right? Anyway. Uh, after that, the other important thing to do, uh, the case sensitive 
the character set. The other thing is not all the words are equally important. So there are words that we want to remove, the words that we want to remove, the library by default removes some words, words that we call stop words. Uh, we already talked about them. And that is the method that is going to do two things. Number one, all the words that are in a particular list that is inside of the library are going to be ignored or removed. And moreover, all the words are going to be transformed to tokens. Tokens, uh, we described this before, instead of having hello world, what we want to do is I want to have a token one, and this token one is going to be whatever group of characters I have from zero to four. Uh, why? Because the next time that I have another hello, instead of copy this hello, I am going to reuse token one. And the only thing that I need to register here is the new position. Uh, why this instead of this? Because remember, what you want is to create a column with the inputs. Each word, each individual different word is going to become one of these columns. So column one, the token one, and I can mark in which documents this word is, or in which topics this word is. Tokens, words, you do not repeat the word, you do not follow uh, this, you use this. And you already should know this idea of tokens because you know programming languages, you know compilers. The first thing that your compiler do is to transform your source code, your input, to tokens. Tokens, yes, data type is one token. Name of the variable or identifier is another token. Keyboard is another token, and you can continue. The compiler is not reading your int x. Your compiler is reading data type identifier, and data type and identifier are correct, and therefore int x is correct. Tokenizer, right? So the next part, the next thing of the pipe, Something that we need to do is not only transform the world to tokens, but we have this power of adding in the production line rules about which tokens we want to use and which tokens or words we want to ignore. And in this process, if I have something here that is crazy, I could ask for this thing to do not pass to the output. Do not pass. Okay, so what do you do? You need to tell me one way to identify these things, the ones that are not correct, or you need to tell me how to identify the ones that are correct. For that, you can use patterns. Uh, patterns, we are not talking about design patterns. We are talking about patterns like regular, uh, regular expressions. Those are something that is already in Java. I am not talking anything about the library is use Java. And something that we reviewed in the previous lecture is this regular expression here. And the only reason because I put this one here is, okay, if you are expert in regular expressions, if you want to play with regular expressions, you can define, define crazy structures for words that you are looking forward to ignore or to use. But a common answer, a general answer is you are looking for words that are one or more characters that could be letters, any letter, or numbers, any number in any particular order. And just to be nice, I am including here, or usually we include the underscore. Why? Because the underscore is used to put two words together in different things. So numbers, letters, or the underscore, whatever of them together, are going to be considered one token, one word. If you remove the underscore, your words are going to be only combinations of letters or numbers, if that is something that you want to do. If you remove the to lowercase, you are going to be using uppercase and lowercase, etc. Question, guys. Do you think that we can do this text mining, like, for instance, with source code? 
can you imagine like I have a class before you, 205. Uh, it's like the second semester of Java. Can you imagine what happened when the instructor asked to do a program like, can you do a linked list? All the students. And then you run something like this in the source code of the students. What do you think could be or are going to be these clusters? Can you identify good solutions, bad solutions? With one group of people? No. What if I have three, four, five, 200 students, 500 students, 1,000 students, solutions? Do you think that a common solution for a linked list can be identified? Doesn't matter who developed that solution, in which order you put the things. Do you think that there are some commonality between the is, for, et cetera, that you are going to use, even though the name of the variables could be different? Yes. Your computer, uh, a tutor. You do not need to know or to understand the solution of the student. You do not need to understand if the student connect the words in the correct order. You can submit something that is not compiling even, but if you are using the correct number of conditions plus the correct number of methods plus the correct number of force plus the correct number of something that we're looking for, we can identify something that is not a correct solution, but a student that is moving in the correct direction. And you can identify the opposite Something that even is compiling is something that is not moving in the correct direction. This can be done with source code. Now, the only reason because I am asking is, if I ask you to evaluate source code, number one, you need to remove the change to lowercase because the uppercase are important. Moreover, if I ask you to change to source code, do you think that we need to, to do something with this pattern here? At least one important thing that you need to add there. Yeah. Uh, I am missing, number one, the dollar symbol, because it's valid. Number two, the operators. Number three, the delimiters. I am talking about the tokens of any programming language. I need to define this regular expression that enclose all the tokens that you are expecting in a programming language, which includes Java in my example before. Makes sense. The only thing that you need to change when you change the type of input from news in the newspaper or in a blog or whatever to programming source code is which are the tokens that you consider valid? What, what is going to be the format of those tokens? Supercase, lowercase, uh, maybe even the UTF, uh, do you want to transform to that? Probably that one is going to be a standard always there, or at least you need to select a particular character set. But the others, things that you configure in the preprocessing of your data, period. Good. Now, after you put everything that you need, and I just mentioned the important ones, but they are not all of them. What I am doing in the last line. Looks like there is a new class here, uh, the pipeline, serial pipes, pipeline. And this class is going to have a constructor and the constructor receive a parameter. What is the parameter? The array with all the parts. My pipeline built with the array, the array have all the pipes that I create. No particular order, all the processing that I want to implement. Done. We have a pipeline and we have an input, remember? With those two things, we can start working. Ah, by the way, remember patterns with Java, if you need to review it, something like that, uh, you can check for a tutorial. Yeah. Uh, does the order not matter in pipelines? The what? The order. Of operations. Smart. You just include the operations that you want to use. Uh, there are a few of them that will change 
because of the order, a few of them, but for instance, the, upper, the lower case thing can be at the beginning or at the end. It's not going to happen anything. Uh, the UTF-8, also nothing is going to happen. Most of the ones that I show you there, nothing happened, but there are others that could be influenced by the order. I am not showing an example of those here. Uh, we could remove the stop words before doing other operations to make it more efficient. Could make sense. I mean, that could be something like improve the performance, like do not make sense to make lowercase award if later I am going to remove it. Yeah, totally agree. Uh, mandatory, not. Is going to affect the result? Probably not. The performance could be improved. Yes, totally agree. Good. Uh, let's see. This will score two things. Uh, the iterator and the pipeline. Use what I showed you before, but as a screenshot of my compiler. Everything there should be clear. Moreover, I include at the top the imports that are happening. I don't care about the imports because your IDE is going to help you. Uh, hopefully you are using any IDE, so automatically the IDE is going to be like crazy importing things when you are using the new libraries. But just in case, this is what I am doing. Good. Now, these two things are disconnected, right? Right now, what I have is this uh, file iterator, iterator, and what I have is this pipeline, pipeline, and as you can notice, they are in a different color because I am not using them for anything. Uh, probably the next step is going to use them for something. And hopefully you can agree with me that we need to put them together. One is the iterator for my information. And what I want to do is for each element, each line, each token in my files to run the pipeline, right? It's, I am the file, this is the pipeline. And I want, I want to do is each element inside of this file should run through the pipeline. Put these two together, huh? makes sense. Now, makes sense. What we're going to do, before that, two lines. What is happening in the two first lines? Do we remember something called instances? Probably from another library, probably from another input, uh, probably from clustering. Uh, instances. The instances. I am going to create an object from instance list. And I am going to use something called a pipeline. Pipeline? And is the pipeline that I used before? Okay, wait. You are going to create a repository at the end that is the place for the output, for the information that I want to use for training my model later. And that place, for the output, I am going to connect with the pipeline. So it looks like this pipeline is related with that place in which my results are going to be, right? The repository for the result at the end, like those space there, connected with the pipeline. And also, next line. Uh, the method tells you something, instances, the output, add through pipe, and the parameter is the file iterator. Files, repository for the output, the pipeline, and what I am asking in one line, for every single file in the iterator object, for every single element there, token, character, pass that element through the pipe. Which one? The one that I give you as a parameter before. And whatever is the result is going to be stored in this class with these elements that I call instances in an instances list. The output, the input, and the pipeline for the preprocessing. Done. What is going to happen in the preprocessing? All the things that you add in the previous slide. Clear? 
Okay, if you strain objects and connecting the objects together, and um, that's it. Yeah, from the point of view of a software engineer, that is the only thing, connecting objects and they are going to work. Good. Okay, now, so far, the two first lines, everything is only about the data, the files that are going to be the data, the pipeline that is going to process the data, and finally, I have as an output the instances that I am going to use to train my model, right? So, so far, is just pre-processing nothing interesting yet. The interesting part, we need a model. We need a model. A model. Uh, we need a class for the model. Classes. Uh, you are familiar with the classes for neural networks. You are familiar for, with the classes for clustering. Now we need a class. We need a model for this text mining. Malet. Malet is going to give you this class. Model. Model. What do you want to do? Uh, I want to search for the topics of a group of documents. Topics. Yeah, soft clustering. You need a topics model, a model for your topics. Ah, moreover, did you remember that we have a problem? This is a lot of characters and two loops of the end to complexity. So if you do this sequentially, I think you can imagine how the cost of reading a file character by characters and converting to topics. And moreover, you can imagine what happened if you do, are going to do that, not with one file, but with several files. If you did a compiler in some point uh, in the bachelor, you know what I am talking about. For the first time, the implementation, a very good idea that is that is we need to use parallel computing. We need to use threading. And you know what? The library know it and the library is going to give you a solution that is going to be creating threads, multiple, multiple threads. To be honest, the only thing that is going to happen is that the library is going to create threads. If you have a computer with multiple cores, and if you have the Java virtual machine, the good news is that your multiple threads, hopefully the virtual machine is going to put them trying to use your multiple cores. Uh, good news, Java tried to do that. Uh, it's very efficient. No, it's not very efficient, but at least try. Uh, if this were C++, you could be responsible directly to assign your threads to multiple cores. If not, all your threads run in one. Uh, this is Java, so at least Java is going to try to do something good. The only thing that you need to do is to create the threads, but we're going to do that inside of a class that is going to have a name to remember you that that class is trying to implement that parallel computing. So your class have this parallel topic model. All that explanation is for you to remember the name of the class. Yes. You don't need to know what is happening inside. Parallel topic model. Your model. New parallel topic model. And I have three parameters. I need your help. Can you guess? What are those three parameters? We reviewed the theoretical background in the previous lecture, right? So according with the theoretical background, do you remember three things that we need to configure in the model or to configure for the training of the model? I am sure that you remember the first one, yeah. What? The constant. The, okay, yeah. Uh, the first one is you need to tell me how many clusters you want, uh, the value for K. Uh, can you imagine that that file there is exactly that, the value for K? So in this example, I am looking for five categories. I am looking for five clusters. Uh, professor, why five? Why not? Uh, you can put a three there, put three, 10, 10, five, five, 10, six, seven, eight, whatever. Uh, the only thing that I, I think you are not going to do, you do not want to do is one. Maybe you are trying to summarize the documents. If you try to summarize the document, asking for one cluster is going to give you the most important words in all the documents. Not exactly clustering, but at least identify topics. But what about the other two? Decimal value, right? 
Do you remember where or for what we have decimal values? And to help you a little bit, do you remember this picture about what is, what is going to happen internally? Uh, do you remember that for each word, you are going to calculate the probability of the word to be in a document because that document corresponds to a set of documents, but also for each word, you are going to calculate the probability of that word to belong to a particular topic. And basically what you have is these two functions, but as usual, for this function, you are going to have a constant. And for this function, you're going to have a constant. And the constants, just like the lettering rate in the neural net, help you to increase, speed up, or delay the uh, modificability in the function. And if you remember, we call those constants for this particular model, alpha and beta, a and b. The next two numbers, a and b. You give me those values. Now, I am sure that you are thinking like, okay, uh, the number of topics, whatever I want, the alpha and the beta, uh, this constant here, Okay, I remember that they are involved in the process, but tell me uh, what should be the values for these numbers? Well, instead of giving you the values, let's talk about lower values and high values. What could happen if you put a high value? What could happen if you put a low value? In this particular example, both are considered low values. They are small decimal. There is no zero to one. When I am talking about high values, is more than one, could be seven, eight, 10, whatever. There is no limit to zero one because it's not a probability. It use a value for a constant and the constant so far is going to multiply the function. So small values and big values. Limitation is a double number. So a small one or big one, as far as it's a double is going to be okay. Uh, obviously, you are not going to go out of 10, 11 or something. Uh, biggest numbers are going to make your model to crash. So let's think about 0 to 10 if you want. The definition for you here. Uh, the first one is alpha. The second one is beta. Use, that is the order. Remember, the alpha is for the word to be in a document. The beta is for the word to be in a topic. The values, highest values, lowest values. Starting with alpha, if you have a value that, or you want to represent a document that have a mixture of different topics, you put a value in particular. If you have a document, that contain, that have a few topics, you put a small one. Uh, basically the value is going to tell you how sparse are your documents in terms of topics. Uh, let me give you an example. If you are using as an input, a document from the newspaper, uh, if you take a newspaper page, anything, uh, Tell me, what could be the case? All the words or most of the words are connected with one particular topic. You can think about, it is possible that the words here are going to go around a few number of topics, maybe one or a couple of them, or the words here are going to be used crazy different topics. So obviously this is easy, this is complex, right? For a page in the newspaper, what do you think is the scenario? Small number of topics or big number of topics per document, per page? And hopefully you agree with If you open a an, an piece of the newspaper and you are reading a particular section, a particular article, that article is about uh, economy, politics, technology, whatever, the words are related with what with that section. Uh, it is not like you are reading something about politics and suddenly they include uh, sports and technology and so on. Uh, the newspapers in particular, information that you can give to your model is each document should be, is going to be kind of a small number of topics. 
Why this information is important? Because you can ask here to be very careful with the increment or with the change of the probabilities of one word belonging to a particular topic. Why? Because when you found the topic, it's very complicated, it's difficult, almost it's not going to happen that that topic truly change. If you already have this article and look like you found high probability of being sport, looks like the probability of the world in general to be in that category is kind of high and not jumping to something totally different. Uh, in that scenario, what you have is this alpha that is going to be low representing that the number of topics in the newspaper per page is going to be low also. Uh, in this example, for the BBC data set, my low value is, yeah, probably each document is going to have, if not one, a couple of topics. Uh, what happened in a different scenario? A, a different scenario could be emails. If I want to review or to analyze my emails, uh, I need to be in the middle because what is the possibility of my email, one email, to be about one topic? Uh, it is high, but not as high as the newspaper. Why? Think about an email that you sent to me. Uh, you can start with, Professor, I want to do an appeal about my grade. But also, can you tell me when is the final exam? And it's like, okay, uh, it's one email. However, it could be two different things. Uh, you're asking for information about the calendar or the schedule and also for the grade appeal. For the emails, maybe this value of the alpha is not going to be 10 because they, it's not like each email is going to be a crazy number of topics, but probably it's going to be higher than the 0.01 that I am using for the newspaper. So one, 0.5, you can play with them. Again, remember, these constants do not affect really the model. What affect is two things, the speed of the model to establish a base, and second, trying to avoid these errors of crazily go to some unknown place and never, never establish the base. Uh, when you have a model that do not stabilize, uh, you need to change the constant. And this is just going to give you an idea of how to change them, uh, reduce a little bit or increase a little bit and play with those. Good. Similar idea with the beta. Uh, now we are talking not about the document. We are talking about the topics and the words per topic. It's like, okay, do you think that for a particular topic in those documents, in, there are going to be a few words related with that topic, a few words that are kind of the keywords for the topic, or there are going to be more several words that are keywords for the particular topic. Uh, a lot of words or a few words. If you think about the news, the newspaper, use randomly try to guess. It's like, well, let's see how many words are going to help me to identify technology? How many words are going to help me to identify economy? How many words are going to help me to identify and put the name of the topic that you want? And the assumption that we're going to do with this particular problem and it's a good assumption, is that there are a few words really that connect with each of those categories. It's not like there are hundreds and hundreds of words related with the sports. It's like, not really. There are a few words that I can identify like, okay, this is talking about sports, or this is talking about technology, or this is talking about one of my clusters. That is my scenario, few words per topic. I represent that, or I give that information to my program with a particular value for better. So the variability of the words in the documents and also the variability of the words in the topics that I am assuming I am going to create. As you can notice, there is no particular number for particular scenarios. It's more like, it is your model. What do you think? We start with a small one or a big one? And remember, this is about running one model 
and probably compare with another and changing the parameters. And these are the only parameters that you need to change. Oh, and the number of topics. It's clear. You create your object, you pass the parameter, and now we can work with the model. And hopefully you can identify the one, two, three things that I am doing with the model. Number one, the more important. I am the model. Those are the inputs. Yeah, the inputs, the ones that come from the file iterator that pass for the pipeline and are there waiting in this instant list. Those connect with the model. Those are the things that I am going to use. All the pre-processed instances that you create before. Those are going to be my inputs. The model, at instance, which ones? The ones that you pre-process, that make the connection. You have the connection, and the next thing that you can do I think is you can get the meaning. It's a model. It's a parallel model. How many threads do you want me to create? How many threads? Uh, guys, depending on the computer that you're going to use. Here in the example is four. Uh, I am assuming that you have more or at least four calls. I am assuming that what I am doing there is at least one thread per core. Remember, Java is working there and helping you. Uh, if you have a better than that, eight, better than that, 16, uh, better than that, hopefully you can have 128 or something like that. But uh, it's not a good idea to put like 64, 128 or something like that if you're going to root your laptop because what is going to happen? The threads are going to go to the stack and are going to be there waiting to be executed, which is almost the same or worse that create a small number of threads, right? Uh, do not think that just because you put there a huge number, 1024, that is going to improve your program. Uh, on the contrary, it could be worse because remember management of threads uh, for your laptop, probably you want to keep that number below 16, depending on your laptop, but below 16 could be a good idea, even more below eight, unless you have a kind of, a good, uh, very powerful laptop, that usually is not the case. Uh, but if you have access to a different computer, a server, then you can improve this number and you can take advantage of what you have, right? The last one. I want you to remember, we are calculating values for the Ws. In the neural net, we were calculating the values for the Ws. Here, we were calculating the values for the probabilities. Remember, what we have is these tables that connect topics with words, document with topics, and uh, word with topics. All this combination, we're calculating probabilities. Each of the cells in the columns and rows are probabilities. And something that you do, you like before, is how many times do you want to calculate those probabilities? And you remember what happened with the neural net when you do it one time. You process all the data, all the rows, all your instances one time, and you get results. Can those results be improved if you pass all the rows again, and all the rows again, and all the rows again? And I think you remember, yes, it can. Uh, in fact, the idea is that you run and run and run and run and run and run and run until you get some kind of a stable evaluation, uh, likelihood, later. When you stabilize, stabilize the evaluation and you cannot improve anymore, uh, you cannot decrease the value of the likelihood more, then you are done. Number of iterations. As a global rule, as a recommendation for this kind of algorithm, the LDA. Uh, number of iterations. Basically scenario in the number of thousand iterations, 1,000 or 2,000 is something that you want to rule for your model, for good results, for stabilization. However, that is the number when you want to create a final result. If you're kind of testing different parameters, usually the recommendation is you do not need to rule 1,000 iterations or 2,000 iterations if you are still in the moment in which you are trying to figure out good or bad parameters, when you are in that test moment, 
checking your parameters. It could be good enough to run 20, 50, less than 100. And you are going to notice how the reports of each of the different rows is affecting your model. I am going to show you the output, but with a few runs, you are going to notice if this is moving faster or slower. And therefore, if you need to change any of the two numbers at the end, you are going to get a result, not the best one, but kind of something that can help you to figure out what is happening. Let me be clear. Your results are going to be something like this. And after 50 iterations, uh, usually if you are doing the things good, you are going to be something like this. Uh, something like that is going to help you to figure out maybe the number for your likelihood, eight. And all the things that is here, and that is the other iteration, are going to help you to go down from maybe this to maybe this. Uh, is the polishing of the model. I mean, I put kind of a crazy example. It's not like that, uh, decimal versus integers, but the point is 50 is good enough to check what you are doing, less than 100, 50, 80, 70, 99. And when you have something that looks promising, then you can go to the thousand. Thousand is going to your resources in your computer or it's going to your resources in the server. So if you are trying to save those resources, this is something that you need to take care of. If you're working in your laptop and you have time, you can run 10,000 every time in your computer, in your electricity. Well, sustainability. Anyway, good. This is my model connected with my input, uh, threads, iterations. The last thing to do, remember the method train in the neural nets? Estimate. This is the, go ahead, train the model. Create my model in one call to a method. That method is the black box that is going to be running the LDA algorithm. All that thing that we explain about calculating probability one again and again and again, uh, obviously with threads, so different threads are running different instances and so on, is that in the black box. You don't need to worry about it. Good, right? Clear. Now, if I run this program with this configuration and you are telling me that I have a model, what kind of result I am going to get? Your result is going to be in the console. A lot of text. Uh, this library show you a lot of logs what is happening, what I am doing. So don't worry, it's not like it's going to be working and you're waiting without knowing what is happening. You're going to have information. To be honest, the information that you need, the important one is at the end. At the end, and that is the reason because I take the screenshot with this process finish. So this is the last part of what, when the program finish. And the last part of your output is the thing in red there. Uh, can you explain me what I have on the screen? Zero, one, two, three, four, those are? The four clusters that I asked for, right? Remember, I asked for five, zero to four. Okay, what about those numbers and those words, more important? The words are the words with the highest probabilities in each of the different clusters. So I want you to notice here, I have no idea. The algorithm is unsupervised. I do not have the correct answers. I asked for five clusters and my five clusters, when the algorithm finish creating these five different groups. For each of the words, I create a link with the topic. For each topic, I create a link to the document. I have all my documents in a particular cluster. And that particular cluster, I know which words are there. The report is, you know what? One of your clusters 
the words that are the most common there, the more probable to define the cluster is government, people, labor, election, party. Can you imagine the name of the clusters? Moreover, can you connect those words that are the result that the system is giving me with what I use as an input here? I know that the input that I provide were in these categories. I know that what is there is business, entertainment, politics, sport, and technology. I know that. Again, the model do not know that. The model, you use all the directories. So the model is telling me, you ask me for five clusters, I detect five clusters for you with different, uh, I am going to explain the numbers with different accuracy for them. Uh, however, what I detect is these are the words that identify for me those clusters. Uh, one, people, government, and so on. The second one, technology, games, user, music, uh, music, show, award, game, England, year one, company, market pro. Looks like you can guess the names. Looks like those words are kind of. Mm, Will make sense. Uh, which cluster looks like entertainment? Can I identify that? Which one looks like sports? <laughs> Did you notice that somehow you agree? Because I am listening three, three, three. <clears throat> like you with the words. This, at least. Looks like for the BBC News, this clustering te technique, this kind of, not a perfect word, not in the numbers, but it's like kind of good. And the time was very slow. At least it's less time than asking any of you to read the papers and identify the words. So in terms of time, a very good word. Think about the same with source code from GitHub. Think about the same using as an input tweets in Twitter, Facebook, newspapers, whatever. Help me, guys, software engineers. I show you how to use as an input files from my disk. Can I ask you, can you help me to use as an input no files from my disk, but connect to a URLs and get information from HTML or web page in a server. Can you create a program like the file iterator, but something more like a web crawler that use, if I give you the root of the page, asu.edu, you can search for sublinks and get, 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 get data. Can you? I am tempted to ask you, but okay, let me think about it. You have a class URL and you can create a pattern to identify URLs and then you can follow that one. And if it didn't give you information, okay, but if you give information, you can create a stream and store the file and basically store all your files and then start running something like this. Hopefully I am giving you the idea that I can ask you to connect to ASU edit, get all the data. Your computer is getting the data. You do not need to visit the page. Your computer can run there for hours and get everything. And then we can do cluster. And then we can figure out the most important information there. And that is useful. And it's a few lines of code because both getting the information and do the cluster is less than 100 lines. I am looking like, I don't know if this is too easy or what. Don't worry, not yet. We're not going to do that. Okay, Cliff, uh, this was done in 41 seconds in my, yeah, in my laptop. So just to give you an idea of what will be. Uh, the numbers, the most important number. You're going to have this report one time and again and again and again and again and again and again and again. 
And you are going to notice that the numbers are changing. The most important one to consider is this. Tell me, what does it mean this 1,000 there? The what? The iteration. Do you remember that I asked for 1,000 iterations in my code before? So can you expect that you're going to have one, a number, two, a number, three, a number. And the last one is 1,000 and the number. 1,000 and the number, the number there, and negative number. A uh, negative number, do you remember what negative numbers we have been using? Negative, uh, likelihood. Log likelihood. Be careful, negative log likelihood is a positive value. Because we do the negative. Of yeah. Okay, so log likelihood, negative number. Yeah, that one is the log likelihood. Well, LL log likelihood slash tokens is the log likelihood of that model divided by tokens. Tokens, what is tokens? Number of tokens. The numbers of tokens, uh, the numbers of words that we use. Well, the numbers of words that we use for the model, that number do not include the words that we eliminate, the stop words and all the words that didn't match with the pattern. So all the tokens, which means all the columns in my model, the maximum number of columns in my model, and it's basically the likelihood divided by that. And it's <coughs> that number. Uh, why we divide the likelihood by the number of tokens? Uh, just because the number was too big? Uh, always is going to be big. We divide it by the number of words, and that is going to give us a number that is small. And that small number is a better representation, at least an easy to read representation of what is the quality of this model. And as you are going to notice, it's negative. Deep eight, which is kind of not exactly good. Uh, what is a good number? Yeah, that is the perfect value. Uh, you are not going to have that, uh, not with this technique, but close to zero or zero is the thing that you search for. So if you have another model and the other model is minus seven or minus one or whatever, uh, it's better than this one. You are using this number used to compare between different versions of the same model. To be clear, you cannot compare this model that is reviewing newspapers with another model that is maybe reviewing my email. Uh, even though the one with the email could have a highest number, that model could have a highest complexity. And that highest number could be for that model a better value that this minus eight in your simple model for the news. So you do not compare different models, different inputs. The only thing that you do with this particular number is to compare different models for the same input. Clear? Okay, you do not compare oranges with apples. That is the point. So minus eight, what you're going to notice, and this is for your homework, check the number, this number, in the iteration nine, 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 and if you compare the 999 with this one, it's almost the same. Uh, it changed the last digits of the decimals. And if that happened, that means that the model is stable or getting to that point of the stabilization. And therefore, these 1,000 iterations are good enough. If you go to the 999 and you notice that the 999 is something like nine point something, and then the next one is eight point something. It's like, okay, I have a still opportunity to increase this 1,000 to 2,000 or more because I still have this opportunity to improvement. Uh, smaller the difference between the different uh, iterations is the model is more stable. Big is the difference, you can still continue the iteration to improve more. Uh, kind of uh, try, uh, try an error, but it works. Good. Now, next.
what happens if one common question that you could have professor you know what i have my input but i would like to remove more words than the standard words in my input there are items there are words that I just do not want to use. I want to personalize this list that you mentioned about the words that the computer ignored. You remember? Uh, you call these stop words without parameters, and automatically the library is going to ignore those words that we know are not important in the documents. I am talking about the and or and so on. But what if I have a particular list of words that for my particular input are not relevant. Let me give you an example. Something that you can do is all my slides are posted there online. You can create a program that connect to the address of my slides. And if you notice, there is an output of the content of the PowerPoint is text. You can get that text. Either you can create a program or you can copy paste the text to different documents. Also, uh, if not for my slides, the lectures, uh, each of the lectures is recorded, but something that I do not share with you, but exists is a transcript of the lecture. What I am speaking is there in a document. So I can give you a document, TXT of my slides, a document, TXT of my speaking every day. And Maybe something that you want to do is like, you know what? There are going to be words in my lectures or words in my slides that you want to ignore. You want to ignore to improve like the quality of your clusters. Because remember, any word that appears more than 80% is a bad idea. Uh, what do you want to eliminate from my slides? My name, the number of the class, S-E-R, something all that information is there in all the slides if you go and check the transcript of the slides it's like my name appeared because it's below in every single part uh, in my speaking i am pretty sure that there are a lot of things that i am mentioning even i am not aware of and it's like again 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 you identify those inputs because you know your data and you can create a list with those elements and ask the computer to eliminate them. Because you do not want to have a cluster or all the cluster with my name there, because you know that that is not a representative input. Okay, what happened if you want to do that? Let's go back to the pipeline. And do you remember that your pipeline is that pipe list? And you remember that here we add several different things. And one of the things that we add is this object, token secret remote stop works. And if you compare with my previous example here, no parameters. Okay, you know what? We want to personalize that guy. And personalized is parameter number one. Can we understand this parameter number one? New file, file, the object that we use to handle the paths. One parameter for that one. The path of your file, which file? A TXT file with what? With words? Which words? The ones that you want to ignore. In which format? Nothing specific. You can put words, enter word, enter word, enter, or you can put all the words in one line. They are going to be identified as a token. Tabs, enters, spaces, use words. And any word there in the document is going to be ignored. Okay, what else? Ah, what else? Parameters for configuration. For instance, these are the words that I want to eliminate. Help me, your document is using which character set? Ah, you know what? It's using UTF-8 is the one that I asked you to transform the input. So my list of words is also in that format. Okay, good. What else? Hey, do you want me to use only your file? or you want me to use the standard file that we used before plus your file. So you still want me to eliminate the and, or, and all those things. 
plus the words that you mentioned in this document, or you want me to eliminate all the only the things in your document, but do not run the default. Uh, one parameter, uh, you want to include the default, yes or no, no, and only your file is applied. Okay, what else? Uh, tell me your words. Do you want me to use case sensitive or not? I mean, your words are uppercase, lowercase, and you want me to look for that exactly much, or you just want me to transform your words to lowercase and search in lowercase? True or false, case sensitive, obviously. True, if you want to make case sensitive. False, I don't care about the uppercase, lowercase. You search for my words in any uh, case configuration. The last one, okay, for all the words that I found, what do you want me to do? Uh, you want me to eliminate them from the output or just mark them for this is not a good word. Uh, basically, your output. These are words, your output are tokens. You want me to eliminate, like that word never exists, or you want me to put some input there like here was the place of a word that we do not use. And what is the difference? For your models, nothing. For your models, remember the training of the model is only using the good words. But there are some other methods in the class that you can use for statistical purposes. Like, okay, uh, what is the percentage of words that we are really using from this document? And that percentage can be matched with all the other probabilities that we're calculating. I am not showing you that. So for us, for my example, at the end, do you want me to mark the word that I am not using? No, I do not want you to mark them. I just want you to ignore them. They do not exist. I do not want to use them. Forget about them. False. You can use this one if you're going to define your own file. If not, the previous one, use an extra configuration that you can do. Clear? Now, last thing, evaluation. Always, always, so okay. Evaluation. I need to talk about that later. Guys, I, I didn't finish. Therefore, I need to talk about evaluation. I am going to talk evaluation in our next lecture. Therefore, I am going to open your homework until the next lecture, and I am going to give you a week starting the next lecture. Not today, because I didn't finish. However, you can start working. This is your homework. This is what I am going to add, just homework that basically you can start. The only thing that you cannot do, maybe, is the evaluation. But please start working, uh, start playing with this. Later, this is going to be the one thing that you are going to submit. Uh, start working during the weekend. We finish next lecture, okay? See you. Thank you.